Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be breaking down Fear Agent Volume 3. The story is going to take a break from the current day events, and we're going to jump back 10 years and learn the history of the Anubis Conflict, which was the initial alien invasion of Earth by the Tataldians, the Dressen, and the Zarin, and we will see Heath and Charlotte and the forming of the Fear Agents. It will also fill in many gaps in the story that we've had so far, in things we were wondering about. So, very exciting stuff, let's dive into it. Fear Agent, Volume 3. Fear Agent, Volume 3, The Last Goodbye. Written by Rick Remender, art by Tony Moore. Issue 12, The Last Goodbye, Chapter 1. Mara is looking around the moon base for Heath. Eventually, she finds him. He is sitting by himself looking at the vastness of the moon. Heath, he is contemplating how he got here. Mara comments that Heath looks a little haggard, and she asks him, Are you drinking whiskey through a straw? Mara tells Heath it isn't his fault. If he'd been here, these goddamn feeders would have just killed him too, along with the rest of humanity. She says that they did everything they could. Maybe God doesn't want humanity around. You ever think about that? Mara also apologizes about making a big deal about Heath's ex-wife being here. She asks him, was it messy? Heath, he just sits there, drinking whiskey from a straw, and he remembers the old days of Earth, back when he was still married to Charlotte and before the aliens came. We now have a flashback to Earth ten years ago. Down there in Texas, Heath is driving his dad, Chuck Houston, and they pull up to the family ranch, the Houston Ranch. After a few hours and some dinner, Heath's son Kent is out playing in the field, and Chuck and Heath's wife Charlotte Houston are all talking. Chuck admits that he has cancer, but he's not planning on getting treatment. He says, I'll be damned before I let one of these latte drinking foo foos poison me with their radiation. Charlotte, she's having none of this though. She tells Chuck that he's being downright selfish. He's got a family here that loves and needs him. At that moment, Heath's son Kent, who is playing out in the field, gets his shirt caught in the barbed wire fence. Chuck, he gets up. He's going to go out and help his grandson. But as they are out in the field, off in the distance, there appears to be some sort of spacecraft flying in the sky. The spacecraft drops a bomb and the explosion engulfs both Kent and Chuck. Heath and Charlotte are distraught. Heath has tears coming from his eyes. He wants to go out in the fire and try and save them, but Charlotte holds him back, saying, you'll be burned alive. Heath is wondering what the hell is going on. He has no idea what to do. He runs into the house and grabs a shovel as well as a shotgun. He brings his wife Charlotte to the semi-trailer truck they have, and he tells her, to hide in there while he goes and looks for help. At that moment, a Dressite alien approaches Heath from behind. The Dressite has a high-tech suit on and helmet. The Dressite itself seems to be some sort of amoeba, and the suit is a way to contain the amoeba. The Dressite starts choking Heath. Heath whips out his shotgun and blasts the Dressite's head right off. Even though the Dressite's head has been blown off, the amoeba inside of it still persists, and it continues moving towards Heath. Heath doesn't know what is going on. He is pointing the shotgun at the Dressite, but the Dressite grabs it and smacks it away. Heath, he now uses his shovel, and he swings it at the Dressite, but the shovel just melts inside the Dressite's body, and all that is left is Heath holding a stick burnt on one end where the shovel head used to be. Heath, he then gets engulfed by the Dressite, the Dressite covering his body and burning through his skin. Heath thinks he is a goner, but he is luckily saved by a different kind of alien, this one in a high-tech robot suit, perhaps allied to the Tataldians. The high-tech robot blasts at the Dressite. Heath is very confused. Is this robot an enemy as well, or an ally? Either way, it looks dangerous, so Heath runs away. Heath's dog is attacking the robot. The robot grabs the dog and throws the dog high into the sky, probably killing it. Heath, he runs to where he has a large semi-trailer truck parked. He gets inside of it and he starts driving. 
as Heath is driving the large truck, it gets blasted by the robot and it tips over and it explodes and it is on fire. Heath is covered in the broken glass of the truck. He climbs his way out. And as he is outside of the truck, there's a fire all around. He looks into the sky and sees a spaceship going by. Keith, he remembers that Charlotte is in the back. He's concerned about her. He goes to the back of the truck, opens the door and sees her lying there. She's still alive, although she is very injured. Keith picks her up and is carrying her in his arms. Keith carries Charlotte off the Houston family ranch. And now he is walking down the road. And while he is walking, one of Heath's friends in a pickup truck drives by. This man is named Otto. Him and Heath go way back. Traveling with Otto is his younger, rebellious niece named Andy. Otto says to Heath, Houston, Jesus, they killed my Loretta. Well, come on, hurry up and get in. I talked to old Pete Timberson over the ham radio and he's got room for a few more in his bomb shelter. Heath, he says, follow shelter, no. Listen, Otto, we gotta get to Reese Air Force Base. They'll know what to do. Charlotte is badly injured. She's gonna need help. Otto tells him that Timberson's boy is a Marine, a medic, home from Iraq. You'll patch her up. So Heath and Charlotte get in the back of Otto's truck. As they are driving, Otto tells Heath that Timberson says they don't got enough guns or food, so they're gonna have to make a quick pit stop before they get to the fallout shelter. As they arrive in town, it is anarchy. The place is on fire. Alien spaceships are still flying in the sky. Otto, he parks the car and he says, All right, me and Andy will go to the food mart and grab what we can. Heath, you get to Jack's and grab all the guns and ammo you can carry. Heath, he leaves to go and grab some guns. And Charlotte, even though she is injured, she goes with him. As they round the corner, they see a portal has opened. And coming out of it are tons of a new kind of alien race. These ones are called Zarin. They are like crocodile people and they have jetpacks on and some are flying in the sky. Some others are also feasting on the remains of humans and stripping them down to the bone. Issue 13, The Last Goodbye, Chapter 2. Keith and Charlotte are making their way through the town, trying to avoid the Zarin. Keith gets forced to shoot one point blank when it gets close to him. Meanwhile, Otto and Andy are at the supermarket. In the supermarket, they come across a woman holding her dead husband that has his intestines hanging out. The woman asks for help, saying her husband has been hurt. Andy tells the woman, Jesus, lady, he's not hurt, he's dead. Don't be stupid. Find a place to hide. Otto tells the woman to come with them. But the woman says she won't leave her husband's side. Not like this. Otto is forced to eventually move on and get some supplies in the store. Otto is a little bit upset with the way his niece Andy was talking to that woman. And in one of the aisles, he tells his niece that she needs to be more human and understanding. Back over to Heath and Charlotte. Their trip to the ammo store didn't go so well. They were forced to retreat to the roof. And on the roof of the store, a Zarin in a jetpack flies by and grabs Charlotte and flies away with her. Keith, he climbs down from the roof and he wants to run after her. But another Zarin, flying with a jetpack, comes up behind Keith. Luckily, Otto shoots that Zarin dead. Keith, he then grabs the dead Zarin's jetpack, straps it on his back, and he somehow figures out how to fly it and starts flying in the air, pursuing the Zarin that has his wife. Keith, he's flying after it, he shoots that Zarin's jetpack. That Zarin drops Charlotte and flies into some power lines where it gets electrocuted. Keith, he manages to fly and catch his wife Charlotte before she hits the ground. And then the two of them join back up with Otto and Andy in the pickup truck. Otto drives them all to their friend's fallout shelter. They all pile out of the truck and run over to the fallout shelter door. Otto knocks and the woman opens it. Her name is Lorraine Timberson. Lorraine tells them to hurry on and get inside. Before they can though, two more Zarins on jetpacks arrive on the front lawn of the house. The one Zarin flies over and grabs Lorraine, slashing and biting at her and exposing her guts, killing her. Lorraine falls inside the shelter down below. 
Otto, he then starts wrestling with the Zarin. They're both grabbing at each other. The Zarin and Otto fall into the shelter, and the Zarin is on top of Otto and trying to bite him and rip his head off. Otto, he's trying to hold the Zarin back. Otto yells to the group, Get this freaking thing off of me! Someone eventually does help Otto, and they stomp on the Zarin's head and kill it. Everyone piles into the fallout shelter and shuts the door to the surface. They all seem to be safe in here for now. They are mourning the loss of this Lorraine woman. There is a whole bunch of people here in this shelter. So we have Charlotte Houston, Keith Houston, a guy named George, who is a conspiracy theorist, a man named Glenn Timberson. Lorraine was his wife. There's Andy, there's Jack Timberson, and there's Otto, who is the uncle of Andy. So that is everyone in the shelter. And while they are all in there, they start hearing a loud noise on the surface. The aliens are blasting the ground with large energy blasts. If these people did not get into this fallout shelter when they did, they would all be dead. Three months later. After many months of living in this shelter, all of them together, everyone is starting to get a little bit on each other's nerves. One of the people in the shelter, George, is obsessed with conspiracy theories, and somehow he actually knows a lot about these alien races that have invaded Earth. I guess he was researching it before the whole world went to a mess, and he was kind of on the right track. So he, talking to him, asks, So the reptile men, the Zarin, you called them, they're just scavengers who follow these other two races around? eating up the poor suckers cut in the middle? George answers, Yes, that's right. I've been prosecuted my entire life for my studies of alien conspiracy. You have no idea how good it feels to be proven right, to finally have people listen to me. The US and many other nations knew we were precariously set between the Tataldian and the Dressite borders for years, but the fools chose to keep it quiet. Decades ago, representatives from the United States came and warned our leaders that the average human monkey would go crazy at proof of extraterrestrial life. It disproves nearly all our archaic religions. They made a deal with the empires for Earth to remain neutral in exchange for a promise that we'd be left alone. But anyone who knew anything about the Tataldians knew it couldn't last. The Tataldians must have started the fight because they knew the dress sites were here, under cover and human skins. I mean, it's common knowledge. They've been slowly taking us over for, for years. Look how evil and corrupt our governments had become. Keith, he starts growing a little bit angry. He doesn't want to hear about all this stuff anymore. It's been months of this. Keith, he's growing angrier. He's been drinking, and the drinking is fueling his anger. Charlotte seeing Heath is ready to kind of go crazy, she's trying to calm him down. She says, Sweetheart, let him go. You've had too much to drink. Not all the whiskey in the world is going to bring Kent and Charles back to us. They're better off in heaven. You have to know that. Keith to this replies, Heaven? You telling me after what you've seen, you still believe that there is a God? You heard that pencil dick? Those things, they prove there's no such thing. Charlotte, tells Heath to stop pushing her away. Let her help him. Heath says to leave him be. He doesn't want to feel better about it. Heath, he smashes the whiskey bottle that he was drinking and he says, I want retribution. I want to kill as many of those things as I can. Heath, he pushes by the others in the shelter and makes his way for the fallout shelter door. He wants to go outside. He doesn't care if it's radioactive out there or not. He doesn't want to stay in this coffin any longer. The others, they're trying to hold Heath back. They don't want him to open the door and potentially kill them all, but Heath, he bulldozes past them. He gets to the door and he opens it. When Heath does open that hatch door, he sees it is snowing outside. Otto fears it is a nuclear winter, but George has a machine that detects radiation and he tells them that they are all clear. The machine is not detecting any radiation, none whatsoever. Later on, 
A few of them put on some warm clothes and they go to explore the outside, see if they can find some supplies. Keith, Otto, Andy, Glenn, and Jack are all in the search party while Charlotte and George are staying behind in the fallout shelter. As the group of them are searching, they come across some humans fighting a Tataldian robot. Otto shouts out, It's one of them that killed my Loretta! Otto, he blasts at the robot with a shotgun. Keith, he jumps on top of the Tataldian robot with an axe and starts chopping at it. Otto, he then tosses a little grenade inside of it. It explodes, but the robot is still standing though, and it's still attacking. It steps right on Otto's leg and snaps it. One of the other humans drives a big construction vehicle and smashes it right through the robot and it seems to have finally destroyed it. That human that finally killed the robot is named Officer Thomas York. We actually met Thomas York back in Volume 1, which was set 10 years in the future. So this is a character that's going to be around for a while. Thomas, he goes over to his wife, whom is injured, and he's trying to help her. Thomas says to her, I'm so sorry about everything, Sarah. I'm so sorry. I took it all for granted. You, for granted, but I need you. I need you so bad. Why, Jesus, why? What did she ever do? Oh, Jesus, God, why, why? Thomas's wife, Sarah, then passes away. Keith and his group, along with Thomas and some new survivors, start walking. Thomas introduces himself to Heath and explains that they've been hiding in that construction site. They went to find some water and that robot must have followed him. As they are walking, they come across some dressites. The dressites are on one side of this field and then there are some Tataldians on the other. These two alien races start blasting at each other. Keith and his human allies are caught in the middle. They try to run and hide. One of the dressites eventually starts moving towards them. Glenn, he shoots at the dressite right in its face. The dressite dies, but it lands on Glenn's son, Jack. And then the dressite, Omiba, ooze, pours out of the dressite's helmet and all over Jack out of the hole. And Jackie burns to death covered in all the ooze. Keith and the others, they retreat to an empty warehouse. Inside the warehouse, Glenn is now crying over his recently dead son, Jan. The group finds some jumpsuits in the warehouse. Keith, looking at them, sees that they are insulated. He figures that they should all wear one. They look outside the warehouse window, and they see some Tataldians and Dressites fighting. No one really knows what they should do. They think it is a hopeless situation. They should just give up. But Heath, he gives a motivational speech. He says, No, I'm not giving up. We're not going to die here in this cold warehouse. We all lost kin, but my Charlotte's hiding in that bunker, counting on me to make it back and look out for her. And I bet there are plenty more still hiding too. We ain't giving up. We're going to march right the hell out of here. They won't follow. These things, they're warring with each other. They ain't afraid of us. We're collateral damage is all. These sons of bitches don't figure that they had a thing to fear from us, but by God, they're gonna. Issue 14, The Last Goodbye, Chapter 3. This issue opens up seven months later. Keith and his band of survivors have started taking the fight directly to the Dressites, Tataldians, and Zarens. They have started teaching these aliens that they are to be feared and they have dubbed themselves the Fear Agents. Keith and these Fear Agents have expanded their ranks, taken on new resistance fighters, and they have also managed to scavenge advanced weaponry from defeated alien soldiers on all sides of the conflict. They have gathered rock attacks, powerful energy weapons, and also some technology that may help them permit interstellar space travel and teleportation through wormholes. We see a conversation that is happening between some Tataldians. One of them is Gentu, whom we saw previously as the leader of the Tataldians in a previous volume. Gentu is talking remotely to one of his main lieutenants that is here on Earth, and that lieutenant is named Cat. Cat is a character we met in a previous volume. 
he was an Astorgian that betrayed his fellow Astorgians so that he could be made immortal in a Tataldian body. While well, we now see that Ket has indeed been converted and is living on as a Tataldian. Ket is on his way to meet some leaders of the Dressite Command. Gentoo tells Ket to negotiate with diplomacy. Though the Dressites are godless monsters, they are acutely tuned to the indicators of duplicity. Gentoo also warns Ket to be mindful of his overconfidence as he is still ruled by emotion. Had he not acted hastily and devastated this world to spite the Dressites, it would have produced many converts to nourish the Empire. Meaning, Gentoo is saying that he wanted to use the humans on Earth here as fuel for them, but because of Cat killing so many of the humans with his bombs to spite the Dressites, the human source of fuel on Earth is pretty scarce. Gentoo, he ends the communication, and Cat marches on with his orders. As Cat is marching with some Tataldians, he comes across Heath and the Fear Agents. The Tataldians do not think much of the humans. They comment amongst themselves, Desperate starving humans, they will be crushed, killed, and destroyed. The Tataldians attack the humans, and they tell them, Resistance is futile. One of the Tataldians closes in on Heath and pins him to the ground. But a new fear agent named Nancy blasts that Tataldian's brains out. Nancy, she then gets sliced in half by a different Tataldian robot and dies. Otto helps Heath up from the ground and tells him, Get with the game, soldier! What we just saw, shake it off! Don't you think about it, not now! You with me? Can you fight? Heath, he replies, It's the only thing I know how to do. Glenn Timberson charges at one of the Tataldians with some sort of spear weapon. He stabs it right into that Tataldian and causes the fuel in the robot to start spraying all over itself as well as on a second Tataldian. The robot's fuel seems to act like some kind of fertilizer. Once it got sprayed on some bushes, the bushes came to life and tore right up and through the Tataldians. It got inside their joints and the plants, it expanded, and it killed these two robots. This is it. This is the Tataldian's weakness. Back in Volume 1, when Heath went back in time, he told the Astorgian leader, Jens, about the Tataldian's weakness. Well, this is when they discovered it. The fear agents now know that spraying the Tataldian fuel on some plant life and then bouncing it onto the Tataldians acts as kind of a fertilizer and it causes the plants to expand and grow into the robots and into their joints, causing them to break down and die. As these two Tataldians are dead now, Cat decides to retreat and get away. One of the fear agents, though, equipped with a rocket launcher, fires it, and the rocket hits the Tataldian Cat, and Cat goes down. Keith and Thomas York walk over and investigate Cat. They think the tech heads back at their base are going to love this. Keith, he leans over Cat and tells him, You shouldn't have came to Earth, friend. You should have been home. Screwing a bolt to that old wife of yours. Cat, strangely though, tells Heath as he looks at him. Bzzz, you, I know you. Cat then shuts down. How does Cat know Heath though? As the whole time travel thing supposedly hasn't happened yet. Well, maybe there's more to the time travel shenanigans we've seen so far than we can comprehend at the moment. Heath and the Fear Agents return to their base with the spoils of war. They bring Ket, now dead, with them as they figure they can study him. Despite some real wins today in the fighting, they did lose many soldiers, so it is a bittersweet victory. In the base, we see George, the conspiracy theorist. He is also the base's main tech expert. Andy, she goes to visit George. Andy tells George, Hey, they brought back a Tataldian leader guy with the voice box intact. George, who is annoyed because he feels everyone in the base is not treating him with the respect he deserves, replies, Yet, 
No one deemed my research worthy of informing me of this? With an active voice box, I can test the translation device. I should have been informed. Andy tells him, dude, I'm sure it just slipped their minds. Lots of people died today. George tells Andy, of course, of course. It's just, well, you understand what it's like. They all talk about me in private. They judge me. I think they want me to fail to prove what a nutcase I am. Andy grabs on to George and tells him in a lighthearted way to loosen up. George, though, he misreads this as Andy being interested in him. So he kisses her and he says, I love you too. Andy does not feel that way about George. George totally misread her. She pushes George back and tells him, Whoa, dude, whoa, whoa, what are you thinking? George says he's sorry. She, you know, grabbed him. Andy leaves and says, Yeah, I learned my lesson on that one. And dude, next time you forcibly kiss a girl, don't do it with a mouthful of Doritos. A few days later, we see the fear agents are building a spaceship rocket of some sort, probably from the scavenged parts they found around the other aliens as well as their own technology. Charlotte, talking to Heath, says, George tells me that he started picking up signals from something called the United Systems? The eggheads think that once we launch this baby, we can track their signal to its origin, maybe even get them to help us. Heath tells Charlotte, know what would be sensible? If we just took this beauty up and made a new life for ourselves in the stars. Just the two of us. Find a shiny new planet and play Adam and Eve. The two of them, they start flirting and kissing and making out. They are interrupted by George. George, he's working on something for the spaceship. He places a device on Charlotte's head. George says he is finishing programming the ship with Charlotte's brainwaves. This has me believe that Annie, the AI we've seen in previous volumes, is built off of Charlotte. This is perhaps why Heath has a sentimental attachment to Annie, the ship AI. George tells Charlotte, simply proceed to engage in a normal conversation for an hour and the program will complete duplication of your thought process. When George leaves, Heath asks Charlotte, why do we choose you for this? Charlotte, smiling, says, Because I'm calm, cool-headed, intelligent, beautiful, witty. Do you need more reasons? Months pass. Keith and the fear agents are having a meeting at their base. They have repurposed and have been experimenting with one of these Zarin's teleportation portals. They have been using it sparingly. They took a discreet trip to the Dressite homeworld to look around. They also did a test trip to the moon to test their space outfits. Thomas York, he had a small scouting party look around the moon, and he found something very troubling that he wants to tell everyone about. When they went up there last, the Dressites seemed to be building a gun on the moon, a big one, and it's pointed right at Earth. It has a cloaking device on it, and you can't see the gun till you're about a quarter mile away. Glenn Timberson asks, why would the Dressites fight so hard on Earth just to destroy it. Heath says he doesn't care. He says, Who has any idea why they're here? It doesn't matter now. Task at hand is to get up there and stop them. Heath asks for tons of spacesuits to be made. They're going to wear them. They're going to go through the Zarin portal, teleport to the moon, and fight the Dressites up there and destroy that gun. The fear agents have also collected some of the Tataldians' Dressite-killing goo. It's some sort of liquid that the Taldians were using against the Dressites that was super effective. Well, the humans have gathered some of it, and they are going to use it on the Dressites. They have nicknamed this goo Slug Killer, and a little bit goes a long way. They have started building grenades with the stuff inside of it. They throw it on the Dressites, and the Dressites containment suits melt. Keith tells York, York, get the troops together and give them the rundown. For the first time in this war, we're taking the offensive. Later on, the fear agents have a big, all-hands briefing on this battle that is about to commence. They are prepping for their war plans to storm the moon. One of the fear agents explains to the group, We're going in hard and loud. Get into the base, set charges, get back through the portal in time for frozen spring rolls and canned tuna fish. 
fear agents, we pull this off or it's all over. Andy, she says goodbye to her Uncle Otto, who's preparing to go through the portal in battle. Andy, she wants to go up there and fight too, but Otto convinces her to stay behind. Andy, she even promises that she will sit this one out. Heath, he goes and says bye to Charlotte. Charlotte tells him, Heath, baby, something feels so wrong about this. Heath replies to her, don't go fretting, Angel. Easy mission. They have no idea we're coming. The two of them, they share a kiss goodbye. And with all of that, the army of fear agents in spacesuits walk through the Zarin portal and arrive on the moon. And it looks like Andy, she snuck in with the forces as well, despite promising her Uncle Otto that she wouldn't. The fear agents now on the moon, they start sneaking. They're trying to get over to where that big gun is that they need to destroy. The gun, though, starts powering up. Keith is worried, and he tells everyone that they need to get moving. As they start charging, an entire army of Dressites appear in front of them. The Dressites seem like they were waiting in hiding. They seem to know that the humans were coming to attack. Almost like someone tipped them off. It seems like this was a trap. Issue 15, The Last Goodbye, Chapter 4 Well, the fear agents are now on the moon, fighting an army of Dressites that were waiting for them. Keith, he looks like a deer caught in headlights, not sure of what is happening or what to do. There's lots of explosions and scrambling going on, and fear agents are being slaughtered. Otto, in a jetpack, flies over and picks up Heath, and the two of them start flying in the air. They are still going to try and go forward on their mission to destroy this gun on the moon before it fires on Earth. Keith, Otto, and Glenn Timberson fly over to what appear to be one of the Dressites' ships flying up in the sky. They land on top of it and break through a window. Glenn, he gets lasered through his chest. He knows that he is a goner, but he keeps fighting on. Glenn, he goes through the window and dedicates his suicide attack to his deceased wife. He shouts, I love you, Lorraine! Glenn, he blows himself up and takes lots of dressites with him and destroys the ship, causing it to crash down on the moon. On the moon's surface, Andy is shooting at some dressites, but one of the dressite soldiers kicks her to the ground and is going to run a spear through her. But Andy gets saved by her Uncle Otto. Otto kills that Dressite with his gun. Otto, seeing Andy forbade his order and followed him to the moon, tells her, Damn it, you promised me, girl! Andy tells her uncle that she's sorry. She just wanted to make him proud. Otto sees that the Zarin portal is open near them, and he sends her back home to Earth through it, tossing her through, saying, I've always been proud of you, Peanut. Now get back home and so I have something to fight for. Thomas York then points at the Dressite control room that controls the big gun on the moon. York yells, Control center is clear, boys! Let's go, 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 go! Otto, Heath, and Thomas all head inside. The gun is still charging up and may fire soon. Thomas, he is setting the bombs up and setting up the detonator. Heath tells Thomas that they don't have time to wait to get to safety before that gun goes off. He orders Thomas to detonate that thing now even though it will kill them with the explosion. Thomas says that they have enough time to set the detonator and get out of here. Keith, he does not think that is true. He yells, detonate that charge now where you stand. They are too slow to act though. The Dressite gun on the moon shoots a huge energy blast at Earth. Keith, he runs outside and sees the blast leave and hit the Earth and then he drops to his knees and he screams, No! Heath, he assumes that everyone left on Earth is dead now. He turns to Thomas and calls him a yellow piece of shit. It's his fault that that gun just blasted at the Earth. At that moment, though, Charlotte talks to Heath through a communication device. Heath, he is happy. He thought his wife Charlotte just died in whatever blast that was. Charlotte explains, though, that whatever blast just hit the Earth was just some kind of electromagnetic pulse. Everyone on Earth is fine, but 
The Tataldians are falling over dead everywhere. So it appears the gun was just a weapon to kill the Tataldians, and it did nothing bad to the humans on Earth. Charlotte warns Heath, though, that a perimeter alert is going off in their base. Heath and the fear agents on the moon start running towards the Zarin portal. They want to return to Earth and fight off whatever is attacking their home base right now. When they get through the portal and they arrive back at Earth on their base, Dressites are all over. A lot of the Dressites are no longer in their containment suits, and they are just in their raw amoeba form, just burning the skin of all the humans down there. Keith, he is running around their base looking for Charlotte, and Otto is looking for his niece, Andy. Otto talks to the scientist, Kevin, and asks where Andy is. He says she would have came through the portal about three minutes ago. Kevin explains, you guys are the only ones that came back from the mission. Kevin then gets covered in a dressite amoeba and burns to death. Thomas York then rushes in with some slug killer goo. He starts firing it on the dressite, killing them. Thomas tells Otto, come on Otto, grab a slug pack and get to work. Keith, he is still looking for Charlotte and he finds George. George is cowering and hiding. Heath asks where Charlotte is. George, surprised, asks, Heath, you're alive? George says he doesn't know where Charlotte is. He was hiding in a closet. At that moment, a dressite amoeba starts moving towards George and Heath. George says to the dressite, wait, wait, not me, I'm a friend. I led you here, or I'm not supposed to die. Otto, with some slug killer, shows up and shoots that dressite, killing it. Otto, overhearing what George just yelled, says, what the hell did you just say, boy? Heath, he starts choking George and asks him, answer the man. What the hell did you just say that thing? Where's my wife? George, he admits, they they promised me I could pick any woman and I, I chose her, but she wouldn't come. She didn't leave me any other option. Heath, in anger, throws George to the ground and he stomps on his head and he pops it like a watermelon being smashed. George is dead. Keith tells Otto, that's it, I'm done. Son of a bitch gave us up. He hurt my Charlotte, so now, now we do things my way. Otto tells Heath, Heath, she might not be dead, her or Andy. Maybe we'll find him, but right now we need to focus on getting this base all under control. Heath, looking downright evil and hate filled in his eyes, says, I'm gonna get it under control, all right. War's over, Otto. We lost. We lost everything. I'm going to do to them like they done to us. I'm going to open that teleporter and drive this tanker of slug killer to where they live. And I'm going to annihilate every one of those sons of bitches. Heath, by driving this truck of slug killer to the Dressite homeworld through the Zarin portal, he wants to exterminate and kill every last one of them. I guess the slug killer is so potent that that if he blew up the truck of it, that would be enough to wipe out the entire planet of Dressite. Otto, he's trying to talk Heath down. Holding him, he argues, Christ, you can't do it. Killing enough a species for what their military done? We'd be worse than them. Heath brushes Otto off and tells him, Get your goddamn paws off me. You ain't never had the heart to do the hard work. Otto then gets surprised and covered in some Dressite amoeba that snuck up on him. The Dressite burns through Otto's body. Otto shoots the slug killer into the Dressite and gets it off of him, but he is too far gone now and will die. His body is all exposed and his intestines are hanging out. Despite dying though, Otto warns Heath, <coughs> don't you do it, Houston. For me, don't you go killing all them people. And don't you ever blame yourself for this. That ain't how it went down. You done the same for me. Save our people. Set it right, brother. Otto then dies. He, he decides to ignore Otto's plea. He is too filled with anger over the potential death of his wife and now the death of Otto and the death of so many others. Heath, he decides to commit a little genocide. Heath, he sets the Zarin portal to the Dressite homeworld. He then gets in that tanker filled with slug killer, and he drives it through the portal. 
Keith, he pops out the other side of the Zarin portal. He is now on the Dressite homeworld. Keith, he then parks the Tanker of Slug Killer. He straps a bomb to it and a detonator. And Heath, he thinks the internal detonator in these slug packs will be enough to blow the tanker. And if Kevin, their scientist, was right, the goo in the tanker should be enough to annihilate every dressite on this planet. Heath, he sets the timer. He starts getting ready to return back through the portal to Earth before it blows. As Heath is walking towards the portal, he sees a little dressite there. This dressite is smaller than any dressite Heath had ever seen before. As Heath studies it more, he realizes that this is a little child dressite with its mother. Heath, he looks around and he sees plenty of dressites just living their life, flying in their skies. Otto's words then echo in Heath's head. Don't you go killing all them people! Don't you do it, Houston! Keith, he kind of starts to realize that if he kills all of these creatures, he might be the bad guy. At that moment, Andy, Otto's niece, she screams out. She says, Heath, Heath, I'm over here. The teleporter sent me. So apparently, when Otto sent Andy on the moon through the teleporter, he meant to send her to Earth, but instead she got sent here to the Dressite homeworld. Heath, he notices Andy, but the bomb is going to blow up. Any minute, the portal to Earth is going to close soon. In all the commotion, the bomb eventually goes off. Keith, he gets sent through the portal. The portal starts closing, and Andy, she's running towards it, and she says, Wait, come back, don't leave me here. The portal closes. Andy does not get in. We assume she most likely died in the blast, along with all the others on the Dressite homeworld. Keith, when he got sent back to Earth, he was knocked out. And when he eventually wakes up, he's in a makeshift hospital-type room on their base. Charlotte, Keith's wife, is there to greet him. Keith, seeing his wife, says, Charlotte? You Sweet Jesus, I thought George killed you. Charlotte says, where did you get a crazy idea like that? When we were attacked, he started acting crazy as a loon begging me to come with him to live with the Dressites. When I said no, he locked me in a closet. Keith replies, I just thank God that creep didn't hurt you. It was him, Charlotte. He gave us up to the slugs. Charlotte tells Heath, the war's over, Heath. The Dressites just up and left right before I found you unconscious in the lab. Thomas York then runs into that hospital room in their base where Heath and Charlotte are. And Thomas he yells out, everybody, everybody, come outside. You gotta see this to believe it. They all rush outside, even Heath. And outside they see a alien spaceship has arrived. Thomas says, they're here to help. They're from something called the United Systems. A red alien with three eyes comes out. He tells all the humans there, I am Swapa, a representative of the United Systems. On behalf of all peaceable worlds of the cosmos, we offer our aid in the reconstruction of your world. Thomas asks, not to sound ungrateful, but where the hell have you been? Swapa answers, we dispatched the Dressites to halt the Tataldian invaders. It was only recently that we learned the Dressite troops were committing crimes against those they were sent to protect. It is a sensitive matter. The Dressites are a peaceable species. Consequently, their military is quite unpopular. Their soldiers are ostracized at home and resentful at having to travel so far to help other beings. Because of this, they took out their frustration on your population while fighting the Tataldians. They saw all the human resistance fighters as terrorists meddling in the good war they fought on your behalf. However, we all underestimated the Tataldian's guile. At 13 Quaylines, Nova Time, every living soul on the Dressite's homeworld was murdered by Tataldian poison. Seven trillion Dressites massacred. Keith, when he hears this, he gasps and goes white. Did he just interpret this information correctly? The Dressites were actually peacekeepers here to save Earth? 
And it was all just a misunderstanding they're attacking of the humans? And did Heath just commit genocide and kill 7 trillion Dressites? Charlotte looks at Heath suspiciously and she asks, What were you doing at that teleporter? Where did that tanker go? What have you done? Heath, he answers his wife, I didn't know. Charlotte starts crying saying, Jesus Christ, you murdered the entire race, an entire world. Heath argues, I did what they did to us. Charlotte, she is not having any of this argument. She says, no, I can't hear any of your sick rationalizations. You're not the man I married. You're a monster. God save your soul, Heath. I, I can't. I'll keep your dirty secret, but you have to leave here. I don't care where, as long as I never see you again. In the background, Swappa is telling Thomas York, we will need an Earthling representative in the United Systems. I believe you would be perfectly suited for such a role. And Thomas, he accepts this responsibility. Months after this, the war is over. Earth is rebuilding. We see Charlotte is living in an apartment by herself now. Keith, he goes to visit her. They no longer live together. Keith, he is going to be leaving Earth now for good. He just wanted to say goodbye to Charlotte. Keith says to Charlotte, Hey. Charlotte replies, I had hoped you were gone. Keith to this answers, I've been on the moon, doing some heavy thinking, drinking, whatever. I buried all the dead. It needed to be done, so I did it. But the ghosts, they stay with me up there. So I think I'm going to get the hell out of here for good. I went back to our old house to say goodbye. Digging around in the rubble, I found Mama's locket. I gave it to you when we first started going steady. I figured you might like to have it. Charlotte, she starts tearing up. She rejects Heath, saying, Heath, we've gone over this. Heath tells Charlotte, I know, Charlotte, I, I ain't here to beg, just to say goodbye. Good luck getting the humanity show back up and running. Heath, he then leaves and walks over to that rocket ship that they were building earlier. Keith tells Annie the artificial AI in the ship, Just go straight up and don't stop till I say. Annie asks Heath, What are you going to do? And Heath says, Don't know. Figure it out as we go. We then jump back to the current day where this volume began. Keith is on the moon, remembering the past. Remembering all the fear agents he served and defended the earth with. All of his friends. Keithy stares at the graves of all the fear agents that died and were buried on the moon, and Heath, he salutes them. And then he heads back inside the moon base, and we see a photograph on the moon ground of Heath with Glenn Timberson, Otto, and Charlotte. And that is the end of Volume 3. All right, that was Fear Agent Volume 3, and I thought this was a really fun volume. I really felt a kind of Walking Dead kind of vibe of these survivors coming together and trying to fend off against the, these outside attackers, in this case being aliens. Uh, I like the artwork by Tony Moore. Uh, really good stuff. I like him a little bit more than Jerome Opinia, who did last volume, so really great to have Tony in these issues here. Now, I really enjoy the overall story here seeing the creation of the fear agents. And I like the twist we had at the end where Heath Houston committed genocide on the Dressites. And the Dressites were actually supposedly there for good. Maybe. We'll see. But uh, yeah, so great twist. And we could see how it weighs on Heath and how it affected his relationship with Charlotte and the big impact it had for the future. So uh, really good stuff. There was lots of elaboration on some questions that we did have from Volume 1 and 2. So we got uh, some answers here, and yeah, very entertaining volume. I'm going to give this one an 8 out of 10. Thank you all for watching, and I'll be back next week with Volume 4.